Hi, I'm Terry Norrington from Kunganesha Ministries, and this week we have been looking at Luke 23. As per usual, we will go through the verses and also give some commentary. So we start with verses 1 to 16, Jesus in front of Pilate and Herod. The whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under, the, um, Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me <clears throat> as one who had been inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will punish him and then release him. So we can see that the Sanhedrin felt that they had enough evidence to take Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor declaring that Jesus is inciting rebellion and opposing the, pay, the paying of taxes to Caesar. There, these are obviously a distortion of Jesus' words. Jesus' teachings are controversial in the eyes of the Pharisees, and it was this that they did not like. What Jesus was teaching goes against their own way of life, and Jesus was pointing the errors of their lifestyle, the errors of their thinking, the errors of their hearts. Jesus wasn't being rebellious against Roman rule as the Sanhedrin were proclaiming. He was against some of the traditions that the Jews and the Pharisees followed because they weren't God-centered. And Jesus wasn't against paying taxes either. We saw in Luke 20 verse 25, Jesus say, And give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Jesus wanted people's lives to be more focused on God. But he wasn't advocating the non-payment of taxes. Pilate sees that Jesus was no threat to Rome. The Jews were expecting a Messiah to come and overthrow their Roman oppressors. And Pilate would have known that. Jesus was the Messiah. And to the likes of us Christians, he still is. But he had a different agenda from which the Jews were expecting. Pilate becomes aware that Jesus was from Galilee and would come under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas, so sends him to Herod to deal with the accusations made against Jesus. Herod was highly delighted. He had wanted to meet with Jesus for a long time and was hoping to see wonders and miracles in his presence. It was almost like he wanted Jesus to entertain him. Where do we go when we want to be entertained? Do we go to church for that? I once heard it said, we don't go to church for what we can get out of it. We go to church for what we can give God. Yes, we want to go to a God-centered church. But in order to do that, we must want to be giving ourselves to God when we are there. With our time, our prayer and our attention. We need to, uh, to get God-centered if our churches are to be God-centered. 
Jesus didn't give Herod the satisfaction of signs and wonders because God's miracles come because of love and compassion for the people in need. And Jesus didn't answer the plethora of questions that Herod, Herod plied him with either. In all kinds of subjects and in all kinds of situations, people have their opinions. And more often than not, they, they think that they should give that opinion. But in doing so, they can make an inflamed situation even more volatile because they think their opinion is more important than others. It takes wisdom to know when to give our thoughts and when to keep quiet. Yes, we are entitled to our own thoughts and opinions, but we don't always have to say it. That wisdom comes from God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't answer Herod's questions. He knew it wasn't, wasn't the right time. So we now look at verses 18 to 25. Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found, him, found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insisted, insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, and the one they asked for and surrendered, <coughs> and the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. So what a difference a week or even just a few days make. Jesus had been hailed by many as he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, with palm leaves being waved and cloaks being thrown on the ground, all in honour of him. Now we see a crowd baying for him to be crucified. Who this particular crowd were, or where they came from, we just don't know. But it's possible that they may have been people that the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders had chosen and assembled knowing that they could be easily manipulated. Pilate had found Jesus not guilty of insurrection. He was not a rebel and was not going to stir up the citizens of Jerusalem to fight against Rome. Pilate had tried to move the problem onto Herod, and Herod had found Jesus not guilty too. But still, the Sanhedrin wanted Jesus killed. The crowd, incited by the Jewish leaders, cried out for Jesus' blood. Pilate tried to initiate a proposal. Having brought in a custom to release a prisoner at the time of Passover, Pilate asked the crowd who he should release, Jesus or Barabbas. The crowd called for Barabbas. Now Pilate's political career was in jeopardy if he didn't keep peace in Jerusalem, so he caved in to the crowd's demands and released a man who was guilty of insurrection and murder and allowed an innocent man to go to his death. He chose the easy option to save his own skin. <laughs> now, how many politici politicians do we see do that today? And also, can we be guilty of taking easy options rather than the right and proper ones? The crowd, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders were also prepared to see an innocent man crucified simply because he taught a message that condemned mo much of what they believed in. Jesus' message proved that their hearts weren't centred on God, but on selfish gain. Jesus spoke the truth, but they didn't like the truth. The truth hurt. But if we are honest, sometimes we are pointed out some truths that we don't like to hear. And they hurt us. Are we going to cover up the truth or are we going to repent of what wrongs we have done? Today there are many people around the world who are persecuted and put to death simply because they proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. There are many who are hurt by the truth of Jesus Christ 
but rather than accept Jesus's message, they would rather punish the innocent message. Jesus took the place of Barabbas on the cross. He took the place of a sinful man. And it was, a, and it was sinful men that put him there, who condemned him to death. And it is our sin too that puts him there. So we stand guilty, as guilty as all of those in this passage who call for him to be crucified. But because we have recognised our sins, believe in him and have repented, we are forgiven. We now move on to verses 26 to 43, the crucifixion, another pa long passage. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way from the uh, in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourself and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with them to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, How, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up, came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the crew, uh, criminals who hung there, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are, are under, the, under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus' death is imminent, and his suffering must have been immense at this particular point. Although in Luke we don't read about his beatings, we do read about them in other Gospels. Jesus was likely to be at, at death's door at this point, but the soldiers were tasked to take him to Golgotha. It's called the place of, the, of skulls. And he was taken there to suffer the indignity of crucifixion. So to ensure that he got to Gol, Golgotha still alive, the soldiers seized Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. All who were sentenced to death by crucifixion were made to carry their cross to the place of their death, just to complete their humiliation. But Jesus was unlikely to make it to that point if, <coughs> if he still carried his cross. So this is where Simon of Cyrene comes in. Cyrene was a place in modern-day Lib Libya, and people make the assumption that Simon was of dark skin. But there is nothing in the Bible to say that. Was Simon a follower of Jesus, or was he a victim of circumstance? None of the Gospels suggest he volunteered to carry Jesus' cross, and here in Luke we see that the soldiers seized him. This would suggest he was forced into carrying the cross. People say that this is where we are told that we should bear our crosses. But in fact, Jesus had said this much earlier in his ministry. If we look at Mark 8, verse 34, Jesus states, If anyone would come after me, 
let them deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus may well have made this remark knowing full well what the future had in store for him and his followers. And may well, uh, his followers may well have known the significance of carrying one's cross too. But the followers wouldn't have understood that Jesus himself would be subject to the humiliating death. The crowd would have taken this, this as, as Jesus had meant to suffer the burdens that we have been placed with. But Simon of Cyrene carries Jesus' cross and there is no sign that he objected. When we suffer for our faith, receive abuse and perse persecution because we stand up for Jesus, it is not only our own cross that we are carrying. Like Simon, we carry Jesus' cross too. Now we look at verses 44 to 49, the death of Jesus. It was soon about to be noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun, sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now I came back to Christianity in the year 2001. For many years my Christian journey was slow, I didn't have a prayer life, I didn't have, I didn't read the Bible regularly, and although I knew about Jesus Christ, I didn't know him personally. I didn't have a personal relationship with him. And then in the, in the year 2009, I went to Romania to do some charity work with an organisation called Cry in the Dark. It was only then that I realised what Christianity was all about. I saw what prayer and faith could achieve. It was my light bulb moment. In our passage today, we see some supernatural happenings. Darkness came over the land and the, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, Jesus utters his last words and breath, breathes his last breath. Well, at least until he is resurrected. Although not mentioned here in Luke, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. For a human to do this, they would have had to tear it from bottom to top. And even then the curtain was so thick that it would be impossible to rip. The curtain represented the division between God and his people. Behind the curtain was a room called the Holy of Holies that only the high priest could enter. Now the curtain was torn in half. God could reveal himself to all people, although Jesus had been doing this throughout his ministry, but his followers had failed to grasp it. God revealed himself to be, uh, to be, <clears throat> God revealed himself to me through Jesus Christ on that mission to Romania, and God revealed himself to the centurion through Jesus Christ. We will never know if this centurion had a faith in God until this moment. And was this the same centurion whose servant was healed by Jesus as in Matthew 8? Or was this the centurion Cornelius who, along with his family, were baptised by the Apostle Peter, having received the Holy Spirit, as we read in the book of Acts, chapter 10? We simply don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But this centurion, having witnessed the death of Jesus, proclaims, Surely this was a righteous man. He recognised Jesus' authority. He recognised Jesus' deity. This was his light bulb moment. Finally, we look at verses 50 to 56. Jesus is buried. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to the decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea 
and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandments. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We read that in John chapter 3, verse 16. And it's probably one of the most quoted verses from the Bible. God, have, God has, has given his one and only son now, and his body has been buried. Many have questioned whether Jesus was actually dead at this point. But when we read the Gospel of John, chapter 19, we see that the soldiers went to break the legs of those being crucified because the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies nailed to the crosses on this coming special Sabbath. But when they came to Jesus, they did not need to break his legs because he was already dead. And they proved this by piercing his, si his side with a spear. Blood and water gushed out. After death, blood will separate and partly become water. So we see that Jesus was definitely dead. John also points out that scripture had been fulfilled. Not one of his, his bones will be broken which comes from Psalm 34. Now Joseph, who came from Arimathea, went to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin and had, had opposed the punishment exacted upon Jesus. He was indeed a secret follower of Jesus, but now that secret would be exposed. With Pilate's permission, he takes Jesus' body and buries it in a tomb that he had had carved out of stone, which was meant to be for his burial. And again from John 19, we see that Joseph is accompanied by Nicodemus to help prepare the body. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, he too was a secret follower of Jesus, and it was he who, who had met Jesus at night and to whom Jesus had preached the earlier quoted verse from John, 30, John 3 verse 16. So we see that both Joseph and Nicodemus have been secret followers of Jesus, although circumstances have forced them to be exposed. How many of us follow Jesus secretly? Who of us goes to church on the Sunday and worships God, but through the week remains silent about our faith? Being a Christian isn't a label we give ourselves. It is a lifestyle. We need to declare ourselves as Christian by both our actions and also by shouting it from the rooftops. So let us pray. Father, we believe that you loved us so much that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let us be bold and shout it out aloud. Amen. <laughs>